I'm Maxim Vachelagrave, and you're watching the Sinkefield Cup live in St. Louis. Hello, and welcome back to our coverage of the Sinkfield Cup. We've got a solution for you on the puzzle that you were solving over the break between Sakhalov and Aronian. Yeah. And Grandmaster Ashley has that for us. Well, we sort of have a double question for you. We asked, what's the winning move? Well, you had to be a detective and figure out who it was that was on turn. Well, clearly, I mean, Sokolov is not playing in the tournament, so you would have guessed that it is Black's turn to move since Aronian, number two in the world, is playing here now. This position is complicated. You've got to be number two in the world, or thereabouts, to solve this puzzle. The move he played in this position where Black is clearly ahead in development, White's pieces on the king side are not out at all. White has only three pieces in play, while Black has four in play and is ready to castle. This poor king looks terrible, and Aronian figured out how to take advantage of it by playing the move Rook to C8, a spectacular move in this position. I just put that up. And daring White to capture on A5, because after Rook takes on C5, it's not possible for this queen to guard this Rook that's under attack from the Black Queen and simultaneously deal with the move Queen to C3 check. That's just devastating, a big body blow in the position. So instead of being able to take the bishop, Sokolov had to grovel with the move Rook A2, and then suddenly Rook takes on C5, exploiting the pin along this long diagonal to the king. You cannot touch the Rook, of course, because the king would be in check. So just a straight pawn lost. And now Queen A1 begging for a trade, hoping beyond hope for a queen trade, but met by this spectacular move, Queen to C6, donating a rook to the cause, but only now caring about checkmate to the white king. White threw in the move, queen E5 check, but then king to D8 sidestepping that, and now white decided to rip off the rook, might as well, but after king D7, he had no more checks in the position, and looking at the position, he realized that he couldn't deal properly with the move rook to C1 checkmate. If he had brought his rook back, then of course, rook to C1, would follow immediately, and it's still checkmate after the capture on c1. Queen follows behind. And instead, if in this position, he had played rook to d2 to try to help out, well then rook to c1 check, rook to d1, and now queen to c2, attacking that rook twice, and after queen d4 trying to help out, well we get back to the thematic idea of rook takes, queen takes, and queen c3 check, forcing queen to d2, and queen takes d2 mate. For the first puzzle of the day, boy, our puzzle master has thrown us a tough one. We should at least warm up with like a maiden two. That one was rough. Maybe you saw it. If not, don't worry. It's the 2800 that solves those kind of puzzles. Guys? That's right. I like the queen takes g5, rook f7, rook h7 made Mate. yesterday by Magnus. That was a good warm up. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that game between Ivan Sokolov and Lavon Aronian when it was played. It was really talked about in the world of chess. You don't see a top grandmaster like Ivan Sokolov getting taken out so decisively with the white pieces. Speaking and, of and decisively. We've got, actually, we've got another note on those puzzles, actually. Yes. The music from them is actually um, part of the, another Singfield love, which is music. Certainly. So um, Jeannie Singfield, um, who also is a founder of the chess club, is also really big into promoting music. And one of her That was a local composition. Yes, exactly, a winner of the Singfield Prize. Um, Katie Andres, and that's the concerto for the horn, and the 2007 Singfield Prize winner. Wonderful. It's yeah. a very nice piece. And we're hearing that right now. Can't hear it. Oh, I can. It's <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, all right. <laughs> Um, big developments in our key matchup between world champion Magnus Carlsen and Fabiana Cariwana. What we have seen, a very surprising move for me, was this move H2, H3 by Magnus. Oh, yeah. A deep strategic move by Magnus. H2, perhaps. Well, <coughs> and also in this particular case, threatening that knight takes E5 because there's no longer that bishop g4 trap. So essentially, this move, h2, h3, says, um, you better take my bishop, which he did. But capturing the bishop, 
The obvious result is these double pawns on G3 and G2, a big strategic uh, concession by white. Well, opening up the rook on F1. But opening up the rook and, on F1. And your point from earlier about castling being potentially problematic because of knight H4, mm -hmm. with the strategic threat of knight F5 and the tactical threat of knight G6 uh, holds especially true here because you can't even move that rook on F8 away because of the F7 pressure placed by the rook on f1 and the bishop. So exactly. I don't even, I don't see how you would react to that. That seems bad. Exactly. So Fabiano did not castle, and instead he sought to uh, neutralize this bishop on b3 with the move knight c5, threatening to grab yet again a second bishop. And now if only Magnus, Magnus has already had a3 moved. in, he would certainly whip out oh bishop a2. <laughs> oh my goodness, I think the position just exploded. If I've got this right, he sacrificed a piece with bishop takes f7 Are you check. Me? No. Bishop takes f7. And the, the game has Wow, exploded. you were right. We see that on the webcam. Wide Magnus open. Carlson, quite confidently and rather quickly. Indeed. Right. He just snapped that pawn on f7. Bishop takes f7 check. And the tournament leader, Fabiana Cariorana, returned to the board and clasped his head. Oh my goodness, did I overlook something? He's thinking, so let us go through and these what is, so what, yeah, ramifications. How many pawns is he going to get here? It looks like two. Well, first of all, if we capture with the bishop, uh, pardon me, we, uh, capture the bishop with the queen, we are looking at this knight takes e5 with a double attack. And keep in mind that queen h5 check is going to be a, a destruction. I'm thinking that black has got to capture with the king. Pause for just a moment. We go, we, we're going to make a, a discover check, but should we open up this bishop or, or not? Just, or just play knight h4 check. Exactly. So knight h4, a double, uh, a discover check against the king. The king would likely drop back to g8. Fortunately for, white, for black, there's no queen b3 check. So we're going to look at this move, knight to g6 with the intention of either capturing that rook or playing rook f8 check. We'll drop back with the queen. Let's just... Hoping to yeah. see the sacrifice and get, after rook f8, you're getting enough wood there. Huh? Right, but we, we well, pause it here because we the, the, there's no uh, necessity for playing rook f8 check right away. I'm thinking about the move queen h5 to, so it's a positional peace sacrifice. All we've got is one pawn at the moment. No, queen h5 just doesn't feel right. Just a second here. No, because you see the more pieces coming to the defense, right? Yeah. Like so we've six, for instance. Right. So we've got to go for it right away. Let's say check, takes, takes, king takes. What else? So now at the technically moment, black's up and wait. Black's got three, three pieces, pieces and for a rook for. A queen and a no. okay. so, so two bishop pieces and knight. And a rook for a queen. <laughs> bishop and two knight and, and rook. Queen. Bishop right. and knight and rook for right. queen, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well now. two bishops. Two bishops and a rook, right. Right. So we can we can flick in the move B two B four. Um I'm not a hundred percent sure that that would be so effective. We'll start so with instead queen H5. let's start with the more obvious Queen H five, uh, answered by Bishop E six developing jump over here with the rook. I don't see this as actually leading into any decisive advantage for white, but wait a minute, this move queen g6 does threaten b2, b4 winning a piece since this bishop on e6 oh, so requires. The pressure is on Fabiano Caruana now. Exactly. And uh, Magnus spent eight minutes on this move. Okay, very a key, key moment. So let's continue this line h5, it still seems See, I wild. You should castle? I mean, I told you, wait, didn't I say never castle? <laughs> yeah, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 oops. Never castle uh, <laughs> is what I heard. Wait, what? Maurice, what's your take on this one? This has gotten wild instantly with this extraordinary move, bishop f7 check. Well, yes, what an amazing move. A spectacular shot just out the blue blowing up the position, and you can see that Caruana did not even suspect that it was there. But who would have? This move does not show up on the computer's first choice of moves whatsoever. Bishop takes on f7, 
boom, now we are wide awake if we were just leading back before. This is an amazing move. First of all, queen takes f7 fails. Straightforward fashion as well. Knight takes on e5. And the point here is that the queen is under attack. This queen is looking to come to h5. That would be unstoppable. And if you play this variation, queen takes f1, and after knight takes f1, trying to get three pieces in this line, then of course queen h5 check comes in nice and rosy, and white is happy. The m computer is saying after bishop takes f7, king takes, bravely going into the discovered check. Now knight takes on e5, it deems best. King to g8, allowing knight to g6. And now the move queen g5 is the defensive move. You won't believe the long and forcing line here to advantage, by the way, for white, for black, excuse me. After rook check, king up, attacking the knight. Now knight takes rook. And in this position, queen e3 check, king over. And this amazing move, bishop to g4. Now his turn to have a discovered attack on white attacking that rook on f8 best move according to the computer queen takes and rook takes and now this knight is trapped must come back out and now rook to f6 and this knight is hanging this knight is hanging white must play knight f1 at least best move for now and then queen takes on e4 in this position and after queen takes and knight takes suddenly we have a position where white's just simply what white at the moment is up upon, but the knight is under attack, and when it comes out, then knight takes here, knight takes, and rook takes. Let's just consider this the forcing line, air quotes. But white is no longer up. Black has a fantastic bishop. The position is even, but that's the one difference, is that dark square bishop. Obviously, there are multiple lines for us to analyze here to try to clarify all this, but this is right now the pressing main line by the engine Will Caruana notice all these moves and steer his way through the ridiculous complications of this line? Obviously, multiple moves. He's now been shocked by a bishop sacrifice in F7. Remember, bishop C4 in move two was aiming at F7, but that was for the old days. Nobody gets to take on F7 these days, do they? Here we are. Wow, and we're getting some great responses um, from our Twitter <laughs> I listeners. Think our Twitter account just exploded. Didn't That's it? right. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got Kara Face who says that Carlson's Bishop takes F7 check is so baller. We've got uh, Chris Bird, the international arbiter, who points out that MBL is checking out the Carlson Caruana game and giving some fun looks, even though it's his move in his game. <laughs> so Bishop takes F7, so shocking that the other players <laughs> stop thinking. <laughs> on their games, they ran over to look at uh, what's going on in this board. Wow. Claudia Munoz, uh, the talented young player who is uh, the co-champion of the National Girls Invitational, and also the first U.S. Junior Girls Closed occurred this year, and she won that title on tiebreak. Wonderful. And she said that she guesses Fabiana will not be castling today. Indeed, <laughs> those are the rules of chess. <laughs> right. Well, Bishop, Bishop F, F7, I would, uh, if, in Fabiana's shoes, I'd step back and just try to be as calm as I could after uh, being shocked by this move. Oh, yeah. And, and speaking of which, uh, another listener of Chess Network says, He'd like to know the exact moment of at, at Bishop F7 what Fabiano's heart rate was. <laughs> yeah, just uh, we know chess is a dangerous game. I mean, we've had a lot of people pass away on the chessboard, and that is a move that would make. Uh, Bishop takes F7. The heart King takes F7 has been race. played. King the takes F7. King takes. I mean, now, the B force. Now, um, in the line that Maurice was talking about in the computer's engine. Computer's engine was taking this pawn on e5, and I shied away from that just because I was looking at that bishop, that dark square bishop suddenly being activated along the diagonal. My first choice was for knight h4 check. I don't know if the computer uh, considered this line and how it evaluated the queen versus uh, two minor pieces and rook variation. I suspect. Uh, the the machine is going to say, oh, just grab the material and hang on. Hey, question. Um, <clears throat> Bishop takes f7 check. Do you think there's a, what do you think the chances are that Fabiano didn't even consider it? I think he 
actually yeah. saw it, but yes, he just kind of dis, dissed it. It's like, a question of no. how much he looked at it, but I think it's just kind of instinctive. If you're not castled and mm. you're a strong chess player, and he's not just strong, he's decent in his yes, parts. decent. <laughs> Number two in the world. Right. Uh, uh, it's just impossible. It's almost like an instinct, right? Like yeah, brushing you, your teeth. Like obviously, you, Bishop takes f seven. It's a move. It's legal. Right, but the, no, nothing that you really pay attention How to. How much did he analyze it? Is a question. Very, very little. And Hikaru Nakamura also finding this game extremely fascinating, stepping away from his uh, bo game with Topolov. The players wishing they could play tag team. Right. And, uh, they are going to get a chance to do a little tag team later in the event. We've got yes. the ultimate showdown, which is going to be a great exhibition match. Exactly. So. Yeah, that comes at the end of the tournament. Maurice, back to you. Just a quick point, Yaz, just to answer the question that you, you posed. Knight H4 was considered by the engine, but it thinks that this line does not work out well for white. And it seems as though Carlson has agreed because he's taken on E5. After Knight H4, King G8, Knight to G6, the simple Queen E8. And after the Rook goes down with check, take the rook, knight takes and king takes, and it thinks that the attack beginning with queen h5 really is not going to hold up and it can defend. Well, we know how confident, again in quotes, computers are in their ability to defend if they don't see the mate or they don't see the way you get your material back, they're just gonna hold it and hang on and figure out some way to maneuver out of the danger. So that's what the choice was for, for Carlson, he decided instead to take on E5, and it looks as though Caruana has calmed down a bit. He went beat red, guys, when he came back to the board. You could see it. He was intense looking at that sacrifice, but I think he's starting to realize that it's maybe a bit of a bluff. He's not going to go down in flames, and if he plays the right moves, according to the engines, Black is the one who's going to have the advantage. Guys? Thank you, for, uh, thank you, Maurice, for that. Uh, and indeed, so far, uh, Magnus has played the computer's main variation. Now, from Fabiana's point of view, the move queen g5 here is intuitively kind of obvious because obviously the queen is under attack, so you've got to move the queen. And you start thinking, well, gee, with this bishop aiming towards white's king, this move queen g5, Rook F8 check. This, these moves are very easy for Fabiana to calculate. Now, here is where he really could run into a little bit of a problem because he might start thinking, hey, I've got great opportunity myself to go and seize the initiative with the move bishop takes H3. For example, bringing uh, the rooks into play. Rook takes, and now queen takes uh, g3 with threats of checkmate, or what that, that nasty little check that, uh, that um, Maurice had been pointing out earlier, moves like queen e3 check. If you can get the guy to move his king, cooperate and move his king into the corner, well then you're looking at queen takes g3 and check this out, Jen. Mates over here on h2, mates over here on right, g2. True. So it's and then if the, the, the you move, play something passive here like uh, queen g1, queen g1, then you, you could might drop back with the bishop, right? Threatening queen h4 again. Threatening queen h4 again. Or check. Wait, pardon me. Uh, the bishop, bishop meant to be dropped back to g4. So this is a, a position where. Car you wanna would look Although at the move can, queen g five. Like you can play like knight f one and knight h two there. How much? How, quite how much material is white up anyway? A lot. So a lot, right? <laughs> so after that bishop h three line, after queen g one and knight f one, we're kind of hanging on, right? Right. I'm thinking. So that, I think that honestly, though, I believe that the well, difference, the big difference between the computer variation that we saw in the game with Magnus, where queen d three, mm -hmm. I think that Magnus had like three minutes at that time. Whereas Fabiano's got a lot of time here. Yes. So I actually oh, think there's right. three chances he's going to, you know, figure out how to defend here because uh, the line is so forcing right. and he's got a lot of time. Well, and there's a flow. Uh, the grandmasters can calculate very well uh, when you have this flowing forcing line. So again, from the start, it looks to me like queen g5 would, minutes actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. would be an optimal looking move. Fabiano would calculate queen g5, check, king, takes the rook, and now you always look at checks. Those are the checks are the most forcing moves. So you look at the most forcing moves first, check to the king, 
Now, I think Maurice's main line, it actually continued King H1. Now, here's where you have a Okay, so why queen stop. and three check first? Because you want the king over here on the H file. In that other variation where the bishop takes H3, rook takes H3. No, I'm saying is there a difference between playing this bishop G4 move first? Uh, sorry, so you're playing we're queen, on you're playing queen E3 check followed by bishop G4, right? Yes. And so I'm asking if bishop g4 immediately. Bishop g4 immediately. I let's, think let's you're see. I guess you can play just uh, you No, knight f3 is not an option. I think you're giving white a, is, no, knight f7 isn't an option. You're giving white perhaps an opportuni uh, opportunity to capture the rook. And what's the body count after a variation like this? I'm not sure. Well, you've got two rooks for the queen, but my attack seems to persist very, after yes. queen e3 check and knight e3. That's got to be very good for black. Agreed, agreed, agreed. So, so I'm just trying to see if there's actually a difference there. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is that after, to review the idea after queen takes g4. Well, again, let's look at the most okay, forcing fine. first. Okay, check first. <laughs> I mean, you got to look at the checks, okay, right? For you got to sure. look at the checks first. So I'm thinking check, king h1, right? So far, so good. And let's toss in, just a moment, let's toss in queen takes. Before looking at the bishop g4 move, do you think, that, because Fabiano's going to be looking at bishop h3 and queen g3 is more forcing moves first. Exactly. I'm thinking, saying, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking that Fabiano is thinking, okay, so, let's pursue the most aggressive line. It may be wrong, but let's... Uh, yeah, for sure. That's yeah. the normal way to calculate, right? Right. And bishop so, takes g3. Wait, wait, you, you were going to do queen g3. Okay, well, let's, th yeah. let, let's try bishop takes h3 because we're capturing and we're threatening to capture on g2 and then we're threatening to capture on g3 and the because check. Because the problem with queen g3 immediately is what you're worried about, like just knight f1 defending with the tempo? Yes. Yeah, okay. So that makes sense. So bishop takes h3, uh, preparing to play rook takes f8. Let's just imagine rook takes a8 for the moment. Yes, fair enough. Um, queen takes g3 now or bishop takes g2 check. Oof. Bishop takes g2 check. Let's give this a, a look-see. King takes a spin. This out for a spin, okay. So yeah. king f1, avoiding Only getting move. baited. Only move. <laughs> and now... Uh, I've, I've got a feeling I've got at least a perpetual check here, if not more, after check. In that, fact, uh, it's just mating. On, that knight on c5 guards the uh, d3 square, which is pretty important, isn't it? Precisely. It's simply, it's checkmate. Well, king e2, Checkmate. Oh, no, 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 king, no. You have king, uh, king, e, f king f e1, you were thinking. After king f2? Yeah, king e1, I was thinking checkmate here. So king f, oops. Well, I was thinking you could also play... King uh, f2. I've got at least wait, a perpetual. Wait, can you play queen g2 check instead earlier? Uh, let's say here, yes? Yeah, I was saying queen g2 check here. So now right. king e3 fails to bishop g3 check, so you must go up to e3. Right, king e1 fails to bishop g3 mate, so king e... So Fabiano, I think he has at least a perpetual check in these sacrificial lines. Okay, that's why the computer liked the bishop g4 variation, because it thinks that black is better and shouldn't go for the perpetual check, if I understand. So that is very interesting. So Fabiano with a lot to think about here. <laughs> very fascinating tactical variations and worth asking yourself these questions as you analyze with your computer, mm -hmm. asking yourself the obvious questions. Right. What about taking g3 and threatening mate on one? And as you answer those questions, you, you can understand the, uh, the depth of the position better, right? Well, exactly, but something else happens. What happens as the grandmasters are analyzing? First of all, if Fabiano sees a variation where he has a perpetual check, it's like an enormous sense of relief. It's like, okay, great, I've got the draw in hand. And then when you realize that you have the draw in hand and you recover from the shock of bishop f7 check, then you start thinking ambitiously and saying, okay, now that I know I've got the draw in hand, do I have a win? Indeed. Okay? So, let's, so uh, this bishop f7 check, as Maurice described it, is an explosive move, but it might just be bluff. Chess. Romantic. But it might just be bluff.
We'll see. We'll oh see. my goodness! A little bit of poker in this uh, in this chess tournament. You know, I like that. All right. Well, there you go. Play <laughs> like a girl. <laughs> go, go for the poker. Go go for the bluff. There's and... actually going to be a combined poker and chess tournament in the Isle of Man in a month, and and Biel's playing. Right. Indeed. You had mentioned that to me. So a month it should or be two pretty. Ago. It should be pretty exciting. Okay. Um, but uh, Almir Skripchenko said he's not very. Well, no, that he bluffs too much. He said it, MBL bluffs too much, so FYI. I may have to come out of retirement <laughs> for the poker chess combination. That sounds right. like fun. See you over there. All and right. we've actually got Taryn. Speaking of, uh, of bluffs and high stakes, this tournament has got a lot of prize money at stake. True. So she's going to give us the scoop on the, uh, the money up top. All right. <clears throat> Yes, that's right, Jen. So not only are these guys playing for their world rankings, but there's also quite a bit of money at stake. They're playing for a total of $315,000. The first place winner will take home $100,000. But guess what? Sixth place, last place, they get $20,000 just for being here, just for showing up. So not a bad payday for these guys. They have a lot of money here on the line. All right, we'll take it back down to you guys. Well, these players, uh, fantastic players, best in the world. I think they're excited about the money. Of course. But that's Being the motivator. Being the best in the world is, is, is uh, even a, better still. I exactly. Mean, Those rating points. Rating points are crucial, and the pride that comes with being known as the world's number one, um, sponsorship and everything else. Magnus Carlsen, world's number one, gosh, I think for close for, to four or five years now, he's, he's been cruising, but he's in. He's having trouble both in the tournament and this game. And this is crucial for the tournament standings with oh, Fabiano yes. at 2-0. Two, two, oh, and, and a precursor perhaps to a, a long-standing rivalry. Um, maybe in order to be number one or number two in the world, you have to have a last name that starts with Carr. That is what we're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, we've got uh, Maurice Ashley actually for more, I think, on our, our thriller of the day uh, with the a romantic sacrifice, Bishop takes F7 check. Yes. An incredible move by Carlson, but as you said, Jen, maybe all bluff. He might have seen the contours of an interesting line and options as well, but there's one predominant feature we should note, and it's the presence of Black's two bishops. White no longer has any bishops on the board, so he will not be able to compete along those diagonals as Black starts to slice and dice into his position. So you took a look at one of these lines. After the move, rook to f8 check. This is the main line for us, and king to h7. Just a quick note, the computer is not talking about this move at all, but I just glanced at what about this? Something Carlson might have said, maybe I can play rook takes, king takes, and get something here. Is there a way to get at this king that's in a little bit of trouble? The engines think, no, you're not going to get particularly along the diagonal. You might want to play a move like queen to c2, for example. But this bishop will always be ready to defend the position. So no discoveries are going to really work out in this line. In fact, Black can ignore this move and just play queen g3 and go about his business saying, I have this position under complete control. Well, the other line is the main line we've been looking at from here, king h7, knight takes on h8. Jen, you asked the question, why not bishop g4? In fact, bishop g4 is playable too. That's a problem for Carlson. Black actually has multiple defenses here. Black is not feeling that much pressure once he comes down and realizes this move, bishop g4, is playable. And if you play a move like queen f1, trade off. And take a look at this calm move. Again, the bishop saying, you're stuck in there, and I'm the one who's attacking Bishops controlling the board. This dark square bishop is a monster. This bishop keeping everything under control on this side. So in fact, it is White who is in trouble here looking to find a way to prove that his sacrifice that has won him material, an exchange, and two pawns for a minor piece may in fact be losing him the game if he's not careful. And you can see there the normally cool and calm Magnus Carlsen is indeed looking quite worried about the state of affairs. Guys? That's right. Thank you, Maury. Some thrilling variations here. And the uh, online audience, of course, is thrilled as well. We've got one particularly high rate of player, Grandmaster Nigel Short, said that he could not hope, one could not hope, for more thrilling games in the Singfield Cup. I totally agree. Um, top 40 chess points out 
Um, that's a tweet we have here on the screen or a hashtag Sync Cup. If Fabiano Caruana wins in the Sync Cup today, his rating will be closer to Magnus Carlsen than anyone's been since 2012. Because, of course, that will bring Fabiano up while bringing Carlsen down, right. this head-to-head -head matchup. We've got another funny comment. Um, it's evident that the weak point of Carlsen is the calculation. <laughs> we call them keyboard warriors. Oh boy, that is so wrong. That's wonderfully wrong. And I just appreciate it. That's funny we, though. By the way, the um, the physical posture of Magnus. Uh, normally, he he's got this kind of laid back surfer cool. But uh, a moment uh, there ago, when we were really focusing in on him, he looked simply worried. And he has, by the way, played the move rook f8 check. And we have seen king h7. And did we see another move, by the way, after king h7? Did Magnus capture the rook already? Um, don't think so yet, no. We're still, we still got Magnus on move. Um, rook f8 check, he spent 10 minutes on that move. Uh, Fabiano spending four minutes on queen g5. As you point out, once he started to see minimum perpetual, he can save some of his calculation for later or for while Magnus is thinking. It's yes. a good practical decision. Absolutely, and again, queen g5 uh, really me met the needs of the position. Your queen is under attack. Suddenly it's going on the offensive as well as defending some key uh, moves, and Maurice has got some lines to share. For another game, I believe, actually, and we did have a, a request. Any chance of seeing the other games? <laughs> Only if they also sacrifice bishops. Yes. And we're going to get our wish because right now Nakamura has the opportunity to get a decisive advantage with a sacrifice of a bishop. We just saw the move knight to g5 by Topolov, knight to g5, threatening to capture on h7, maybe get a maneuver in the position. He's also threatening to take the knight on h5, by the way, so this looks like an all-star move. But wait, the computer has discovered bishop takes f2 check totally overturning the apple cart. This move now, if you recapture, king takes f2, queen to d4 check, and it's white who's being sliced. Look at this monster bishop. You can't move to any square with this king. King to f1 just drops knight g3, and that's a sweet-looking checkmate. So that's a problem. Queen d4 check must be answered by rook to e3. And now rook takes on e5, ignoring everything, just going after this one piece. We can throw in the move, bishop takes h7 check, but so what, after king to f8, now the main question is, how do you defend this rook? You can't move your knight because your queen is going to be taken. That's one of the best lines, actually, now, because you're in desperate straits. After queen to e2, simply rook takes g5. And we can compare the kings. This guy is the problem. Plus, this pin is happening. This bishop might be trapped. This knight is thinking of coming in the game. Queen to h5, queen to h4, check. All kinds of moves. After bishop takes f2, check. The computer is saying, that's it. White is busted. Well, clearly, it's not that easy. But for a guy like Nakamura, who's used to sacrificing, I've seen him sacrifice a queen on f2 and drag a king into the, into the position and then just eviscerate it. I think right now he's studying that move, and we're going to see Bishop takes F2 check once he comes out of that deep calculation. Guys? Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely agreed. We just saw Hikaru Nakamura looking at Carlson's game. Now he's looking up at the sky. He's going to say, I'm going to show you how to sacrifice a piece on F2. Right. A remarkable echo in both Indeed. games. Uh, weak F2 square, weak F7 pawn, right? And one side and it's perhaps a, working better than the other. In this case, bishop takes f2 is begging to be played. In fact, I don't really see uh, a, n not only a better move, but obviously in terms of we have the situation where the queen on h, uh, queen on d1 is attacking the knight. The bishop has this uh, threat on h7. This is an absolute must. The problem is Topolov has forced his opponent to sacrifice and the problem is the sacrifice works. King takes f2, and, and as the problem Marie is, it doesn't matter if check, if not <laughs> rook e3, rook takes. Yeah, now, all these pieces are just Yeah, falling. right. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, bishop takes h7 is not really the move that you want to do. I was thinking maybe a better chance of holding on was this move knight e4, except there's a really sweet uh, well, you winner. Just take, you can just take on e4, right? No, I was even thinking there's something even better. Oh, Notice that the king and the right. rook are connected to one another. If you can push the king away 
and you can. Yes. This yes, check. I can, right. And look at this she sneaky so little sneaky. bishop. Oh, that's all she wrote right there, bishop a6. And this was child's play I for was also Hikaru. thinking that e4 was inadequately defended because your knight on d2 is pinned. Oh, you mean just go ahead and grab it. It's probably not as good as your move, but after rook yeah, you just... And there's a double pin. Exactly. There's, there's this queen on d1 and... The, Look at those Roy Lopez pieces. Maybe uh, you should start playing the bishop's opening because, you know, you get your pieces developed more quickly. Well, <laughs> no, one of the things about the Roy Lopez, and that's why it makes the Marshal such a popular opening, is that white is, is kind of like uh, backwards for a little while. Mm -hmm. His pieces are in the back. That's right. So that's why sometimes you see brilliant attacking wins mm -hmm. um, for black in the Roy Lopez. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, when white is uh, too passive on the back rank uh, with his bishops, I want. Uh, so don't cast on, don't play the Ray Lopez. <laughs> Those are our lessons today. No, no, <laughs> Just kidding. no. So it, this all started, by the way, from b4, b3, attacking the bishop. The bishop dropped Bringing back. Bringing it to the back. Yeah, yeah. The bishop dropped back just to keep this pawn on e4 uh, well protected. Queen d7, e5, and all of this happened. Knight g5, that was a big ask. Uh, Topolov certainly overestimating his position. And Maurice, are you trying to say that there's yet another game that is exploding? This can't be real. Absolutely, and on the F2 square as well. Take a look at this madness that's going on right now. The move queen b6, a daring move by, by Aronian. He's just played queen to b6. The point being that this bishop he's claiming is pinned, but actually it's not pinned at all. He's trying to aggress this pawn, but it turns out that MVL can just play the move d5 and say forget about f2. If you want it, you can have it. Queen takes f2. Check leads nowhere after the simple king to h1, and now it is actually white who's threatening to take on, on g7, take on b7, sometimes even play a move like rook to f1, and black's pieces aren't developed yet. And look at this bishop going straight through to this rook in the corner. It is white who is dominant here. If he finds the move d5, he's not sacrificing on f2. I guess he is sacrificing on f2. He's giving away his f2 pawn in order to open up the game and just blast black off the board. All he has to do now is find the move d5, and it's going to be all she wrote for Aronian. His position is going to collapse like a house of cards. Just incredible. All these games now, extremely exciting moments. We're waiting for him to play this move d5, and Aronian will be in deep trouble. Guys? Like he's he about. was I mean, reaching for it, wasn't he? I mean, he really was. Uh, Max was ready to play the move hey, he's D5. He's the Sinkfield Cup shirt. Good Very man. Very cool. Represent. One thing I love about the uh, the swag they give away here is it's actually really nice. It's it not like really that t-shirt you put in the workout drawer. No, no, it's no. It's like no. the one that you actually wear under your blazer. Yeah, <laughs> they got good polos here. Love um, it. What a round. And uh, I thought going into this round that it was actually, again, an overused word, but a critical one as the tournament's shaping up. If Veselin goes down 0-3, oh, oh my gosh. What I thought it was going to be hard to upstage round two. Yeah. And I was wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I, I'm bad at predicting, but that was, wow. So d5, I'm really expecting that uh, that move will be played just as I'm expecting with a, a high degree of certainty that Hikaru is going to play bishop takes f2 check. I mean, he, he wants to do it, it's, and Veselin knows that he's overlooked something in his calculations. He complained about it yesterday that he's just not calculating well, and this looks to be another case. This move, knight g5, was simply a blunder. A he uh, overestimated his position. Um, let me ask you this. Who do you think is most likely to uh, grab a draw today? We, we know that another... Uh, grab a draw? <laughs> I don't know if anybody's I mean, grabbing a draw. You think there's going to be three decisive games today? It sure is shaping up that way, yeah. Of the three... Um, I think I think Topalov is going to lose. Okay, and, I can uh, see that Bishop F F2 Bishop looks F2 decisive. Is gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Magnus, uh, better chances to save. Relatively speaking, yes, but we've still got to see how that. I think Magnus, after making the rook check, by the way, has still gone into a, a, a deep think. He hasn't. Uh, uh, concluded which is the best capture. Rook takes H8 check, uh, drawing Black's king into the, out of the corner, but 
uh, giving up material, or playing knight takes h8, because the variations that we've been looking at with knight takes h8, these bishop g4 and queen e3 ideas, uh, I think Magnus recognizes that uh, queen e3 check, bishop g4 variations are actually in his opponent's favor, and I think he's looking for a save here. He right. would be very happy to find Indeed. a way out. Who, who's better at that than him, right? Oh, he's, he's, he's the Houdini of chess. He's, he's remarkable. Just take H8 off the board and then <laughs> start And then thinking. figure you out. Yeah, but that okay. Be, that would be technically within the rules of chess, but bad sportsman chess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just see. Did, no, okay. Um, Max did not play the move D4, D5. He's played, by the way, a very human move, uh, I must say. With this rook on f5, it's a very natural thing that white wants to do is play e2, e4. But as Maurice was pointing out, the, the difference between playing d5 immediately and playing e4 is when you play d5 immediately, the bishop's diagonal remains open. After, for example, e4, you go drop back with the rook, d5, the bishop's not as effective because the e4 pawn is simply in the way of the bishop's diagonal. So, I'd, so e4 looks like a very big missed opportunity. Still looking pretty hot for white, though, indeed. I mean, you wouldn't want to be black here, would you, even after e4? Mm, I, would, I would be very happy after e4. I wouldn't want to be black after d5. <laughs> <laughs> And Maurice and has got something. He's just like, his eyes just went buggy. What happened, Maurice? Well, it's incredible because in both games, the opportunity has just slipped from their hands. Nakamura did not play Bishop takes F2 check. Instead, he played the calm G6, protecting his position. And Vashiela Grav did not play D5, which was winning. We just, the computer's just saying you're almost up a piece in the line after d5. It's so, it's so excited about that position. So a missed opportunity at the exact same moment, both players back down and miss these crushing blows. I'm sure they will be kicking themselves when we show them this. You think we will? I, I'm gonna be asking that question when I interview them for sure. But definitely a moment lost. However, in Nakamura's case, he might have given away something, but in Vashi Legrau's case, he still has a great position. E4 is a tremendous move, and this move still puts Black uh, under a tremendous pressure. He will be probably donating an exchange soon, according to, according to the computer, because his position is so bad. White is beginning to expand in the game with a lead in development and the whole nine, two bishops. Everything is in favor. In the meantime, Topolov has to stare at this position, which is not easy at all for him still uh, after this move, G6. But he has to be counting his lucky stars that the position did not explode after bishop takes f2. Actually, the computers are now saying that this position is dead even. So Nakamura missed a gigantic chance to capture on f2. He's going to really hate himself if this game does not end in a win for him. Guys? Remarkable situation that at exactly the same moment, uh, two big opportunities for decisive advantages were squandered literally at the same time. That's, that's, that's strange. Something in the, something in the air uh, today? Uh, missed opportunities. Uh, but, but one of the things that uh, the, this move G7, G6 really attracts your eye. You start to think, hey, well, I can just snabble a pawn, and in case of knight takes h7, queen takes h5 check, I'm a happy camper. No, 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 no. Uh, winning a pawn, I think, will still allow these moves, bishop takes f2, and uh, so forth and so on. I'm thinking that here, um, Veselin might start to think, okay, pull in his horns a bit and play a safe move, like knight f3, opening up this bishop and offering a trade of, tre offering a trade of queens to neutralize uh, the situation. If and we've got, oh, sorry, yes. I was going to say, if Veselin is very um, optimistic, and maybe his level of confidence won't, wouldn't justify it, 
uh, even a move like queen g4. Uh, the idea behind queen g4 is that in case of a trade trade and the knight comes to f4, then you're, you're banking on this discovered attack uh, with knight e4, knight f6 ideas, as well as bishop takes f4. That's right. All right. So meanwhile, uh, Magnus has made the decision in his game against Caruana. He played knight takes h8. He did. So not a rook takes h8 check, but rather knight takes h8. And in other news, uh, Maxime bashir le still with the, a lot of pressure on Levan Aronia and um, after down e4, upon, but ooh. after e4, rook f8, bishop to c3. Very quiet approach. I really Attacking the queen? Yeah, I was really thinking that <clears throat> this move, d4, d5, was simply begging to be played. I think what uh, Max is counting on is that with this move, queen b2, he, it's a double idea. He wants to get a battery going on the long diagonal as well as a battery against his pawn on b7. If he can induce the move b6, then I think he's hoping that after d5, oh boy, a trade, a trade, that's a big check, by the way. You bring the king onto a light square so that this bishop can pop out on h3 and bishop e6 check would be decisive. This is what Max is hoping uh, Levon will allow. That's right. I mean, this just looks fabulous. Indeed it does. So uh, big pressure on Levon Aroni, and he still has to solve his problems. Maurice, can he solve his problems? He is definitely in trouble in that position. White has all the trumps, the two bishops, the center, the open files for his rooks, Black's knight sitting on the back row. That looks terrible right now. But also, there's an important moment happening in the Nakamura-Topolov game. It seems as though Topolov has one chance right now. Because Nakamura has so many dynamic trumps, with his two bishops as well, I mean, these bishops just look tremendous, steaming into the position. This knight getting ready to hop to the F4 square. It looks as though the smart defensive move, if he finds it, is to toss in the move E6. And the engines are actually now saying that he's slightly worse after this sacrifice but he needs to do it because he's going to be a bit more worse if he doesn't. So after e6, f e6, and then the move queen g4, it is white whose pieces are starting to grow a bit uh, in power. You see the scope that his pieces just got because of this move. The best move given now to keep some kind of edges, knight to f6. And now the calm queen back to e2. Now the knight can't jump to e4. And now he's gotten control of the e4 square. His knights can go to that square, and he can play a bit more positionally down a pawn. But this pawn, he might win back, and his pieces are going to come alive once this knight lands on e4. So a chance for him now, if he realizes it, that he is, <laughs> can thank his lucky stars, the sacrifice didn't happen on f2, and now he has a chance to sacrifice and breathe a bit with his defensive posture. Guys? Oh, uh, quite a remarkable idea. The idea of e6 is very, very sensible to break up black uh, uh, kingside structure, but the idea of e6 combined with queen g4 and then the retreat, that is a remarkably so subtle, sophisticated idea that would not occur to me. Uh, when you go forward, you want to keep going forward. I like the idea of e6, I like the idea of queen g4, I like the idea of knight e4. As Marie said, uh, white has to neutralize black's initiative. e6 makes a lot of sense. Let me just bring that uh, move, uh, that position up on my screen. I do like this move e6, I do like the move queen g4, and again, as I proudly say, the move queen e2, that retreating move would not occur to me. I would want to linger over here on the king side a bit, I would be attracted to the move queen h4. How about you, Jen? Wouldn't you yeah, want to keep like your some king? Fun. Yeah, this is well. You just you're 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 there. You're there. I mean, and there's a reason why you spend a lot of tempi uh, to build up these types of attack. Uh, nothing decisive, but there's a potential blow on g6. There's also I do I do want to point out that this knight on a5. Uh, could there be an exchange sacrifice, although it doesn't look like too much opportunity. Here, Maurice mentioned that white's pieces could grow. 
as he brings them over, he maneuvers them. It's like well, a, that's what happens in Ray Lopez a lot, right? Yeah, you they, just maneuver your pieces over to the king action. side, and then you you, you, you drop something, uh, you drop a bomb on the position. So, right, that Bishop on D one later can come in after a sacrifice. So, mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, I'm really uh, keeping a close eye and seeing what Fabiano is going to do in this game after Knight takes H eight. We looked at Bishop G four, Queen E three check. Um, all possibilities that look sufficient for black. Yeah, I like the queen e3 check. Maurice, you've got some more thoughts. Just confirming what you said, Yaz, an alternative is queen h4, and the engines are coming around to agreeing with you. Queen h4 is a much more aggressive move, keeping the queen close to the king, and the possibilities, as you mentioned, are there for white to expand, but with a more aggressive queen. Once that knight leaves off of the d2 square, it's going to join his colleague on the king side, and it is white who's looking for the initiative in that position. Still down a pawn and still a smidgen worse, but definitely showing some signs of compensation as compared to what he was suffering a couple of moves ago, actually just one move ago. Uh, this is a great alternative. Guys? What might have been? So, I was surprised because um, I thought Nakamura looking up at the ceiling suggested that he was looking at Bishop F2. For oh, some definitely. Reason, and that he liked it. Something about him seemed really confident to me. And I don't know. I just, I was, uh, that's why I was surprised. Not as much as the computer analysis, more just his, his posture. I, I would have bet the house yeah. on Bishop F2. Really, I would have. I mean, I'd gone all in. I mean, that, that uh, Hikaru would have played that move. And by the way. He would have been broke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd be out of the tournament. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Topolov did smack down E6. He has yes, made E6 the sacrifice. Has been played. And he, even though he started with two losses, Veselin, um, he's a player who loves the initiative. He smacked down e6. I'm expecting him to play the, queen g4. Bring it up in the yeah. board. Uh, e6 and takes on e6. Both have been played. Right. And this is where Maurice uh, had mentioned that the computer loves the move queen g4, just getting out of that pin. And, you know, it's the USC tradition of a student body right. And just throw everybody, uh, all bring all the pieces over to the yeah, king side. Yeah, we're ready side. to go knight takes h7. Right. <laughs> and knight h7 is in the air. And we've seen this move knight f6. Well, that defends. So I'm, just to just to point out knight h7 being a threat because if uh, if if king takes h7, there's that queen takes h5 check or queen g6. Both right. good. And, and if uh, queen h7, bishop g6 also Bishop good. lurking on this b1 diagonal, that's huge. So we back were, to defend. Back to defend. I'm, I'm glad that my sense of chess understanding hasn't. Uh, um, I haven't lost. So much after <laughs> analyzing. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I haven't lost my my chess understanding, and the computer is warmed up to uh, Queen H4, just hanging around so the, the king side. The computer is happy that it finally agrees with Yasser Sarawak. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. I don't even. It's like God. Why the do computer I keep this has agreeing? an awareness of Yasser Sarawak, much less agrees with him. But here, uh, I do like what uh, Topolov is about to manage to do, which is launch a pretty fierce attack. I'm really shocked that, uh, you know, um, uh, Hikaru, who loves the initiative, would willingly subject himself when Bishop F2 was just begging to be played. Um, by the way, let's just go back to our key game that's determining uh, the leaderboard. Um, and Fabiano is also uh, looking at his possibilities. Well, he's got, he's been thinking for over nine minutes, but he does have another 45 minutes, so. Um, and pretty, he recognizes this is crucial. This is key. Pretty good time management, I'd say, in this game. Right. I mean, he's, they're already on move 20. I, I think that considering the stakes and the complexity of the position, he's been managing his time quite well. Right. So I'm looking at queen e3 check. Uh, King H1, we're calling box or only move. And then again, uh, the computer's first move is Bishop G4. And Maurice, uh, ages ago, has pointed out a long forcing variation. But I mean, the human in me would go, well, I got to look at Bishop takes H3. I mean, this would, I mean, it's just such a forcing variation. And I, again, we have seen this specific line ending in a perpetual check, right? But uh, you would think if you were black and you reach such a position, your instincts would say, I've got more than a perpetual check. I mean, uh, I've got, you know, the king is, is, is sitting there uh, 
I, so, so queen g2 check? Well, I was thinking queen check, king here. And you're thinking to yourself, how can I get that knight on c5 into the game? How can I get that bishop on b6? You've got the bishop g3 check, but then he's going to run away. So I this was, is where you, what you were saying, so you were after, about to say I was in. Yeah, so after, after we, that king walks up, I want to be able to play bishop f4 check. So I'm looking right. at g5 here. Ooh, exposing your king, you might also, well, knight e6 gives up control of the g5, uh, d3 square. So, okay, g5, setting up for the the very obvious bishop f4 check. But now you're giving black, an, uh, pardon me, white an opportunity. To make a move. Yeah, <laughs> I get you to make a move, and a very good thing that white has that opportunity. So something like knight f3, we're still going for a walk, by the way. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for, but maybe the walk will be a, a pleasant enough one for you. <laughs> Walking the plank, right? Walking to, into so, sudden death. So knight f3 might not be the best. Um, I mean, you could just play, a, <coughs> you're up a lot of material here, right? So yes. you could play something like rook f8, intending to sacrifice on f4. Counter sacrificing. Yeah, uh, and rook just to try F8. to remove some of your attacking pieces. And by the way, you do set up for a rook f7 check, as exactly, you say. Exactly, yeah. Uh, removing that. So there's the, I don't feel like there might not be enough wood, wood there. Yeah, so we, we know we've got the, the, the draw in hand, so to speak, the perpetual check. Um, and if we play bishop b6, setting up a discovery um, after queen g2 check. Okay, queen you g2. You have what, you, bishop b6 here. Well. You have the possibility of knight c4. But then so, you can grab the pawn with Yeah, and I can check, take the queen, exactly. And uh, reduce your uh, material and deficit. And where does the king move? Well, he'll go to d2, unfortunately. I mean... Oh, you, oh, okay, you're looking at that line in d. Yeah, okay. just giving back. And by the way, unfortunately, the, the queen c2 check could expose the black king a bit. Yeah, that could ruin some so of your So bishop b6, knight c4, but wow, this is a lot to look at for both players. Right, isn't it? yeah, and again, from Fabiano's point of view, he came into the game, realistically speaking, a draw would be excellent for his tournament victory chances. I'm pretty sure he's analyzed queen e3 to a perpetual check. Does he go back here and he says, okay, now I want more. Now I want bishop g4 in the line Maurice pointed out ages ago. And I do believe, by the way, that bishop g4 does give uh, black a considerable advantage because the line looks very forcing. Once again, queen takes, rook takes. Again, it's very hard for the human to give up on this bishop takes h3 sacrifice. The knight is trapped. It's got to come back. Then suddenly rook comes out here to f6, attacks the knight. Pawn on g3 is hanging, pawn on e4 is hanging, knight on d2 is hanging. Not much of a better move than knight f1. And recovering some material with queen takes e4 and black, black for choice. Just this ending again, we're just following the main line ending that Maurice had pointed out to us ages ago that black could get into a position of rook and bishop versus rook and knight and um, have a have superiority. Have a fun, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. Better rook and better minor piece. Magnus would um, love to have black's position. Grandmaster Jan Gustav said from Chess 24 mentioned that yeah. uh, Anish Giri first pointed out that Carlson's love for bishop g5 in Spanish structures is unhealthy. <laughs> An unhealthy love for bishop g5. Uh -huh. um, I love <laughs> pins too, so I'm guilty. Uh, count me. I, I, I share the same weakness as Magnus Carlson. <laughs> <And now let's laughs> Not the it. same strengths, unfortunately, but the same weaknesses. And uh, let's move over to Turin, who has a little yes. behind-the-scenes look at how the Sinkfield Cup coverage all comes together. All right. Yes, Jen, I join you guys in the bottom floor of the Chess Club of St. Louis. If you follow me, this is our production setup. Right here, we have our directors and producers. You can see our, all of our monitors and even all the lit up buttons that they push to make this show go on air. These are our graphics guys. And then I'll take you into the studio behind this door here. And we can come say hello to Jen and Yasser hey right there. over here. Hello. We've got our camera crew 
And then we have Maurice over here in your little corner. How are you enjoying it? I'm loving it. These games are tremendous, tremendous fights. It's all you could ask for when you're doing a chess tournament. You're commentating. You don't have to face any other pressure. You just get to trash talk about the games. It's the best thing in the world. You know how to trash talk, too. Mm, from Brooklyn, you know, we, we know a thing or two. Now, some people have been curious. You've been using this board all during the broadcast. How does it work? How do we know where the pieces are during the broadcast? Well, it's a touch screen, so you're able to, to move anything you want. And, and right now, it's a critical situation. Uh, Kairana can either take here. He, queen takes G3 is the best move. Sometimes this touch screen doesn't like my finger, so I, I have to go to the mouse and, and grab the piece like so. Uh, I, I think it's some oil or something. On my, I think it was the chicken wings and trying to get the, the, the food off my fingers. But, but uh, it's a great setup, and you're able to analyze and get all the screens going, so it's a lot of fun. Now, I understand there's also a magnet that we know where the pieces are at all times for each player, too, correct? That's on the DGT boards that the players are using, so it's automatic. It just comes in. It's great technology for chess in this generation. I mean, before, we, we had uh, the, those uh, demo boards where they had to pick up the pieces and put them in slots. Uh, that was, that's, seems like so many ages ago now. Now the technology makes chess presentation fantastic. Awesome. Well, thanks. Let me get out of here. These guys have a show to do. And that was uh, that was fantastic. Yeah. That was very unexpected. I know. I felt shy. I'm on camera all the time, but now it's like a camera on a camera, and I'm like, uh oh. Oh boy. That's a, that's too that's too many levels for me. Now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now suddenly we have to check and make sure we're looking well. But it's nice. Um, by the way, I wanted to mention on one of our breaks that the security is rather lax around here, and uh, we allowed uh, Rex Singfield our <laughs> our, to, the to, to come in and uh, snabble on our food. And I was explaining to Rex snabble. That, uh, <laughs> uh, that it is um, great to be a commentator on a uh, chess tournament where the games are so exciting. It's very, very hard when the players are playing very ultra solid and ultra safe. Here, uh, the players are swinging for the fences, and it just makes our job so much easier. And I was basically thanking him that it could be a part of this historic event. Oh, was, absolutely. The best, not me, the best tournament ever, maybe. Not just the strongest. Right. My unbiased Now, here's assessment. a thought, and I was talking to Rex about it, and I think he's absolutely right. On all the great historical events, you've had tournament books. And uh, he was encouraging um, us to start to think in those terms. We should get uh, the players to annotate one of their best games from the tournament. We get all of the uh, people here that have been writing a uh, copy about what's going on during the event. Lots of photos. So get and we have, depth, yeah. yeah, and to have absolutely. a tournament book. And, and I think the he's best absolutely part about right. that is it'll give something for you guys at home to buy. There right? you go. Oh, the so, Cubo, I mean, you, you're watching us for free, right? Right. So, oh, well, you can also come out here and buy tickets. The Cubo Tea apparently has an online store now as well. Oh, how cool. So if you want to support the St. Louis Chess Club and all these amazing initiatives they're doing, there are ways for you to involve your wallet. And <laughs> join the club. Just join the club. Make uh, the St. Louis Chess Club and Scholastic Center your favorite charity. That's right. It thousand, is mine. thousand members and counting. So... Um, we are going to take a quick break before we get into the thrilling action approaching time pressure here at round three of the Singfield Cup.
I'm Magnus Carlsen and you're watching the Sinkfield Cup live here from St. Louis. How can you not watch after that? Yeah. Um, and we do have Grandmaster Marty Sashley with the solution to the Magnus puzzle, the Magnus Carlsen puzzle that we presented for a break. I'm sure you guys all got it. It's a tough one. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, the puzzle master thinks we have a very sophisticated audience, and we do, because he's throwing out some really interesting puzzles. Well, this one is definitely one of those slash and burn puzzles, so at least the first couple of moves, you, I'm sure you analyze pretty quickly. The move bishop takes, pawn was the move, and after pawn takes, just keep going. Rook takes pawn with check, forcing the king to have to take. You're not going to allow the rook to stay alive here. After rook takes seven, you'll be mated. So knight takes, and now queen takes, and wondering exactly how you defend the mate on the h7 square. Well, there are a couple of ways, but neither one is really appetizing. Black chose to move knight to f7, and white very commonly played pawn takes knight. So now, although down a rook, that king, that black king has no more protection and is about to get creamed by white's pieces. So king to g7 was tried, and now the move rook to d3, just continuing the attack straight. Black in deep trouble here, tried rook to d6, and after rook to g3 check, rook to g6, and now queen to e5 check, and the queen and rook are just circling that king now, and the game ended quickly after king takes, queen check, and then he tried to stay connected to his king, uh, th that was the rook, only to fall for queen to d7 mate. How many moves was that? Uh, it took from move 21 to move 29. I'm sure you guys analyzed eight, nine moves deep, just at a clip, like Magnus. Back to you guys. Wow, I love that though. That's like a little epaulet made in the middle of the board, right? Yeah, it's Very a nice pretty. one. But boy, it's a it's a tough one. And like <laughs> like Maurice was saying, a very sophisticated audience. Well, we do have needed to I find mean, that one. We have that some solution. very strong players listening. I mean, so far we've gotten shout outs from Nigel Don, Short, Don Gustafson and Nigel Short, Short and, and I'm sure there's some other and Trent you had mentioned. Yes, um, exactly. So. Yeah. And we do have some moves in our key That's game. Right. Bishop uh, G4 was played. Okay, so uh, we have seen that uh, Fabiana Caruana Car eschewed the perpetual check that was on offer. He did go for the variation suggested by the computer, Bishop G4. Magnus played Queen F1. Again, a variation that. Uh, Maurice had pointed out some while back, so the players have been playing slowly. Um, I think Maurice was looking at rook f8, queen f8, and so forth. Instead, we see this move, knight d3. Wow, big time move. That's a, that's a big move here. And, oh, no, and that, just, that the had just appeared on the board, huh? And the idea uh, that Caruana is hoping for is that in case uh, White grabs that rook in the corner. There's no way that he can withstand this brutal checkmating attack uh, of black. Right, before you had queen g1, but now knight f2 check and seals the deal. Big time. Take the queen, take the queen. No, take the king, <laughs> take the king. Exactly. Wow. So knight d3 and uh, Magnus Carlsen under all kinds of pressure here. He's got to come up with a, a big time move himself. How, what can he do? So he, Queen E3 check <coughs> on, on and, and, and just to note that um, Fabiano spent almost a half hour in Bishop G4, but then followed it up with Knight D3 instantly. Rather quickly. So let's see what he has in mind. In case uh, uh, Magnus captures the Knight with Queen takes D3, then Rook takes F8. A uh, lots of pieces are are hanging. There's That's this right. e5 check. So well, e5 check, we can we can in we between take bishop this, f5, right? We take this. Um, we also could take. We could also play rook d8 um, and and skewer your. Oh, oh, that's a nice one. Nice, nice eye there, Jim. Rook d8. I like that move very much. As you say, that knight on f7 isn't going anywhere. Knight, pardon me. The knight on h8 is not going anywhere for the moment, and maybe. Uh, skewering that rook on d2, uh, the knight on d2 is better. Although you are giving me the opportunity, no, you're not. Knight f7 is met by the Suizhenzu queen c5 check and the queen on d3. Uh, white loses on the spot, in fact, so he has to find a better move than knight f7, perhaps moving the queen. 
But this looks very nice now. Everything working for black. Great attacking pieces. I mean, you do, you can, yeah, and queen f5 check here, does it work? Because does the knight is hanging. We just hang, uh, we just, we just capture the queen and take the knight. Yeah. And if we try knight f7, well, guess what? We could get skewered in a different way by queen c5 check, king h1, rook f2, and oopsie daisy, there goes the knight, and Magnus's tournament uh, takes a big dive. And Karyuana in the driver's seat here. So queen takes d3 is not... Uh, it's not looking too hot. Not looking hot at all, oh my goodness. Uh, Maurice, uh, what has Magnus got to do to save his position? He looks in, he to looks my eyes, yeah. <laughs> he's in bad shape. Maurice, help me out here. What am I missing? What an incredible sequence by Caruana. Believe it or not, the engines are saying that black is only slightly better in this position, slightly half a pawn better, but you've got to be in shock no matter how cool you are, James Bond cool is, is Carlson, but this kind of move, man, this is like Dr. No with a gun to your head. This looks <laughs> really, really bad. Uh, knight to D3, it's just sparkling, scintillating chess by, by the number two in the world, the youngest player in the tournament, Fabiano Caruana. He's got the, all these attacks. Every white piece looks like it's hanging, except for these hiding back here just to stay away from black's pieces. It looks as though the best line so far that the engine came up with, well, now it's been churning somewhat, and it's saying it has to go down this queen takes d3 path. It wanted to try the idea, the weird idea, knight to g6 at first. But now it's realizing, although that's defending this rook, trying to somehow get this queen to bail by taking the knight, it now is starting to realize that this attack is just way too powerful in the long run. Queen takes on g3. And now, the reason for knight g6, believe it or not, not only to defend the rook, but to throw this pawn in the way so that this knight can protect it and just fight off that crazy bishop on the c7 square. However, black can be cold-blooded right now and play this line and leave his own pieces hanging in this position here. Now this is a highly dangerous position for white. He's got to deal with the fact that a check could come. This bishop could end up on this long diagonal with a king just staring there, waiting for it. So for example, the move knight back runs into just a series of moves. Black's having fun here. Just taking with check, dropping back, going again with check. Obviously he cannot be touched because of the pin. And then just dropping this bishop back. How cold-blooded is that move? Just dropping the bishop back, knowing full well that he can put his bishop on b6 Anytime he wants, white cannot touch his knight with the queen because of that move, and the position is just overwhelming. We had talked about this before. Caruana was in a position where there was an embarrassment of riches. How do I attack you? Your supposed sacrifice in F7 has just completely, brilliantly failed, and now it's just a question of how do I put it to you? He has found a tremendous way, and he's the one looking extremely calm and confident while hunting down the number one player in the world. Just a tremendous situation for this young man as he starts to rise and prove himself on the world stage. Guys? That's right, Maurice. Uh, Fabiano Carrana leaning back here after some uh, grueling calculations, no doubt. Um, one thing that also intrigues me here is that we've got a little boy um, in a green t-shirt. He looks like he, he was the one taking down the chess moves. But he's been there the whole time. It's been like wow. three hours. Look at that kid. Wow, that, that's a dedicated fan. Well, he's getting, I mean, if he's going to pick a game to, sit, to stand and watch for three hours, he's picking the right one. Exactly. Good eye. Well, again, I just boldly point out the obvious that the, vic, the, the number of decisive games between these two players is a remarkable eight. Five wins for world champion Magnus, three for Fabiano, and uh, just uh, six draws. And it looks once more like we're about to see a decisive game between these two competitors who are the future of chess. Uh, not only chess today, but it looks like Fabiano. And inspiring kids, not just that kid with the green shirt right there, but kids all over the world oh, that absolutely. like. Chess is fun, chess is wild, it's not about draws. Like, even at the highest level, we can play this like swashbuckling, 
exciting stuff. Right. And uh, we've got a, a across the board. All of the games, by the way, are are oh, okay. are full of fight yes. and vim and vigor. And maybe this one just tastes the cake. Um, this Magnus game is just awesome. Tweets Daniel Wrench over at Chess.com. Um, do you guys agree that there's great chess so far in the tourney? Um, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. It's been pretty dull, hasn't it? Yes. No, 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 no. That, I mean, I before the game, before the tournament, uh, Rex and I had talked, and he said. Look, I'm expecting amazing games. And I said, well, you know, Rex, you know, temper that a bit. You know, these guys, they don't lose that often. But what we've seen, uh, the players have really uh, produced wonderfully. I mean, just kudos to, to, to them all. And going through the games, by the way, every game is exciting. But look what has happened in the Topolov match for just a moment. When we left it, Topolov sacrificed that pawn, seized the initiative with e6, followed it up with queen g4 and queen h4, as Just I would have expected. And then this creeping move, knight d2 to f3, unleashing the power of these bishops that have been dormant uh, towards black's king. The knight, after bishop d5 to defend the pawn on e6, the knight took up this great central outpost in the middle of the board, knight e5. Hikaru's queen in full defensive mode now for black. Uh, and Hikaru, because we, we were eyeing sacrifices on g6. Exactly. So Hikaru seizing the defensive with this move, queen g7. Bishop d2, sweet little tempo against this offside knight over here. And if we see, for example, a move like knight c4, we can't see that, pardon me. That would hang a piece. If we see a move like the knight dropping back to c6, first of all, we could take that and take the pawn on e6. So if the knight dropped back, um, well, let's say the black. Theme kettle knight, just what yeah, we want. Let's say black went in for rook a8, defending the knight. Check this out, Jen. The bishop takes up this fantastic diagonal. Well, now you're going to knight for me. Yes. You saw it before you even got a chance. Uh, I mean, I, or you know, all kinds of sacrifices. I see, a car, you know, White storm cloud, leaping. storm oh, clouds into the game, over indeed. over Hikaru's position. And here. meanwhile, I think one player is is totally bust out. Um, Grandmaster Maurice Ashley has more for Levon Aronian's woes against NBL. Yeah, that one's ugly and over. I mean, it's all over, but the crying right now, this position is toast. We saw here the maneuver with bishop to c3 and then queen to b2, b6, black trying to hold up this side. White wasn't even interested in that side just yet. He played the move d5, looking to break open this side, as you mentioned in the line, Yaz. And after the move, bishop takes, queen takes, king over. He could have played this move, bishop h3, wouldn't have led to as much as he got, which was the crushing e5. Pawns don't belong on your fourth rank. When you see two pawns standing side by side in total control, you know you're in trouble in this moment. And now this bishop unleashed and awake. He tried a5, but then pawn takes. And a, look at this protected pass pawn, making this knight look silly on this square. The knight tried to wriggle, wriggle out. Unfortunately, here came, queen, here came queen b3 check. And after the king went in the corner, give me yet another pawn. And everything is falling apart on this side. And we see the move queen takes, rook takes, and knight c7, a blockade. But knights don't like to blockade on the c7 square. Too far back in their position. Now rook to b7, and after rook to c8, now rook to a4, and this position is simply dominant for white. He's played rook a6, has black, and he's waiting to see what comes next. Uh, actually, white did play a move, the move h4 and king g8, and it's just a question of can white find the way in. The computer is suggesting the move rook to d4 with the idea of going down to d7. That looks pretty powerful and also pretty obvious. So it looks as though Aronian, who was just a half a point behind Caruana, is going to stay on one and a half while MVL surges, and he's reaching now for the piece, and it looks like he's going to play it. That hand is just, just cocked. You see the way it's looking. It's going to go to that square. Not much for him to think about. A bit surprised that he's even hesitating here, and he's reached for it, and he has played the move rook to d4, and this should be ending quite soon. Guys? Oh, so the Frenchman with two names. Looks like he's going to catch up. Absolutely. Get his uh, even score back on. Yes. So really great, uh, great performance so far with the white pieces. Indeed. And, and uh, I think we can see great things from him because you got to admit, yesterday that was a little bit of bad luck. 
oh, falling right into a very trap. Very much so. For somebody else. Yes. It wasn't even made for him. Exactly. And great preparation by Vladimir Shushilov along with Fabio. Fabio. <laughs> Caruana. I hate to bring up an unpleasant memory, but an another example of bad luck. Um, Kamsky, yeah, some absolutely. preparation that he had prepared for, for Topala for his world championship. You uh, fell into it, and he won a brilliant game without. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just a bad, bad day at bad the luck. office when that happens. Could have been and somebody else. Exactly. I was victim. not luck in chess, but I think in this idea of preparation and just falling headlong into something that easily could have been another victim, and then you would have known about the game. Exactly, I would have, I would have avoided it. But there you go. That's how it happens, and. Um, I just wanted to point out why this move, rook d4, by the way, is such a bone-crunching move. Your white um, is ready to double rooks on the seventh, uh, break the blockade of the knight on c7, and after, for example, a4, rook down, a3, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes, a2, just a second, you're one Oops. move away, bishop but I've got bishop d5 check. And the worst part is, that the king is about, you've got the Swizhenzug to chase the king far away from this pass pawn after bishop a2, rook a2, c7, the players can shake hands and Aronian will go down to his first defeat. And that looks like a very forcing variation. That's right. I mean, that's a really important endgame motif actually, just finding variations where you can get that pawn to c7, and yes. it's defended by a, a by rook. a rook, and you and you get the discovered. You get exactly. your rook out of the way, and then you promote it. Exactly. In yeah. our key key matchup game, uh, Magnus. Levon looking lonely. Yes, uh, it's a horrible feeling uh, nursing a lost position. Um, knight d3. Uh, Magnus didn't see any choice. He ended up capturing uh, the knight on d3, which. Uh, we had looked at captures, captures, and then, Jen, you found uh, your eagle eye there, a tactical eye, this uh, nice little move, rook d8, with the skewer against this, um, pardon me, this knight on d2. I, I did want to correct myself, however, against knight f3, queen c5 check, I could block the check like this, and so, um, Magnus could still struggle on, so it's not a definitive over, over, over uh, type of situation yet. But there is this. Are you ready for this one? Uh, after knight d3, let's say rook takes, knight takes, there is this funny kind of dance <laughs> that I, I was chuckling about. Ah, oh, right, just improving the position of your king slightly. Well, <laughs> the, yeah, well, the knight on the knight looks trapped. It's not, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that black is winning this one. The knight looks very uh, strange on this circuit. Let's try that again. We could, for example, well, no, we still haven't that trapped the knight yet. Track, we yeah. still haven't trapped the knight yet. The knight can jump out. So Magnus not dead dead. But uh, looking in trouble. Looks like we've got another move in that game, actually. Right, um, Fabiano playing uh, queen takes g4. Just so neither rook d8 or king takes h8. Instead, just queen takes g4. Look, we talk about the calm, cool, collected uh, nature of this young man, Fabiano Caruana, and that's a a nice move. So knight, ta knight on h8 still trapped. Absolutely, and in the meantime, we're also eyeballing this pawn on g3, and you just clip a pawn and continue play. Um, by the way, the obvious rook f1 would allow a standard type of checkmate, which we see all the, all the time when you get this open h5. Yummy. Yummy. So, and we've got... Um, Maurice is talking to us about the uh, um, Levon Aroni again. Maxime Bashir Legrave and Levon Aronian has continued to come upon, upon the lines that you mentioned, hasn't it? Right, gone straight down that, that pathway, and uh, we're going to be seeing handshakes very, very shortly in this game um, because there's just no way that Black's A2 pawn is going anywhere. This move, Bishop D5, just puts the kibosh 
on in fact, any he ambitions. instead of taking on c7, he actually played bishop d5 check uh, first. I beg your pardon. So after rook takes c7, um, I'm sorry, I think he already played bishop to d5 check. So he didn't even wait for a2. Uh, we could, just a second, I, I apologize. Oh, so rook takes c7, bishop d5 check. Immediately, inter, rather than rook c7, and then, yeah, so just a slightly then, different move order. Right, but we get precise, it's just a transposition, essentially. Transposition, exactly. Yeah. We get the same uh, same variation where the And the end, handshake, wow. As predicted. Wow. Another decisive result in the Sinkfield Cup. And <laughs> MBL rebounding after this difficult loss yesterday. Meanwhile, Levan Aronia now on an even score. And I tell you, this is uh, a beautiful game. This will go down in his collection of best games because he really, really outplayed Levon in this one. I mean, the Levon very early made that decision to go for the pawn and give white this dominating bishop on g2. Very, very strange Beautiful judgment. Beautiful bishop. So yeah. bishops are good and don't wear orange. That's what we learned from this game. Wait a minute. Orange is the color of Holland. Holland, uh, <laughs> you're upsetting our chess fans. Don't say that. No, orange is great. But no, seriously, this was a very strange judgmental decision by, a judgment decision by, um, Levon in this game because this looks like a kind of game that Levon would win with White. He loves sacrificing and having un right, imbalanced, right. And imbalanced Max, positions. And what about Maxime's uh, repertoire? His choice of openings in these first two games with White couldn't be more different. Yeah, well, it goes to show just how versatile all of the players yes. are at the very highest. They're, they're able to punch with the southpaw or right. <laughs> orthodox. Because not e4 only did he play d4. e4 in one game, but in the other game he actually started, he started with the, the game with knight f3. Right, exactly. And then with an early g3, kind of uh, much tamer, mm -hmm. and the other one just mainline scotch. Well, a shout out to Ben Feingold, who came in very early in this round and said, hey, listen, we're seeing the stayed quiet openings, but they're going to explode into fireworks. Right. And he, he just nailed it perfectly. Well, there's Ben right there, Ben Feingold over at Leicester's. And Ben Feingold's not shy about saying, hey, MBL is my favorite player mm -hmm. who's alive. He also liked Tao. Okay. And it's funny because um, I was actually giving a lecture at the chess club a few weeks ago, and there was a kid in the front row, and he's wearing like a little kid, maybe about 10 or 11. He's wearing sunglasses, and I'm like, what's up with the sunglasses? Are, are you a, are you a big fan of Nakamura or something? Referring to last year's Synchro Cup, where he uh, wore the sunglasses successfully against Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. And the kid's like, yeah, I like Naka, but I've got an even more favorite player. And I'm like, who? It's like MVL. <laughs> wow. How cool is that? And of so course, French... he had watched, uh, he had watched some of Ben Feingold's lectures. Uh. Um, in, on the YouTube channel, there's lectures by all of the grandmasters who give lectures here at the chess club. Right. And there's one that I actually watched before the Sinkfield Cup, where Ben Feingold goes over some of his favorite NBL games. So mm -hmm. I encourage you guys to check that out. And getting inspired, like the young boy you were Exactly. Making. Very right. nice. Well, after you're done watching these games, of course, because I know you're going to be looking for more chess after that. Now, speaking of little kids getting inspired, green shirt, he's not leaving. He's no. staying to least handshake. <laughs> and one of these one of these kids is gonna be his favorite player. Um, Caruana and Carlson, um, do we have any more moves here? We do. Uh, when we had left it, we saw this uh, very cold-blooded queen takes g4, just grabbing the pawn, knight f3, and now uh, there's a second pawn on offer as well as this knight on h8. One day that knight on h8 has got to be captured. So let's just imagine. Take it eventually. Yeah, yeah, let's just imagine king takes h8, keeping this move. Queen takes g3 in the reserve, in reserve at the moment. Uh, Magnus is going to have to end up playing a move like e5 to tame that bishop, but I don't think it's going to solve his problems. Magnus in big trouble here, and just on the on a material note, uh, as soon as that g3 pawn falls. The material will be even, and uh, Caruana has all the attacking chances that, uh, without having sacrificed anything. That's right. And, <coughs> and a time advantage as well. What is the time? Just, just five minutes more, but still, 18 minutes for, 18 and a half minutes and uh, 13 and a half and counting for Magnus Carlsen, who's now on move. And uh, Maurice has some thoughts for us on mm. the other game that's remaining, um, Topalov and Nakamura. An absolutely rich game, and maybe 
Having missed it once, he might not miss it a second time, Nakamura. A threat to the F2 square. It looks as though he has a move that does not seem like it's possible at first blush, but may work out. Knight to C6. The natural knight takes knight looking to put the bishop on the C3 square can be met by the completely opaque knight to H5. Like, what's that about? Your rook's hanging on this side. It looks like I can take a lot of things, and you're only after this one pawn. What's going on? Well, it turns out that if you were to play the move knight takes rook, then suddenly bishop takes on F2, back, in, back on track, and now takes, takes, king takes, and now this move, queen to d4, check. And the king again is getting mated, a la that variation he had a long time ago. And if bishop to e3 to stop it, then suddenly queen takes on b2, check. And it's black who's winning the game. So a possibility here. White can control all this back here after this exchange and knight to h5. Black could, in fact, uh, sorry, white could, in fact, play bishop to c3 and make sure that he's able to get a queen back after it's all done. Or in this position, he could just play for compensation, which the computer says is slightly worse for him, but he's been slightly worse for a while with bishop to c3 takes and takes. But here, black will have solved the big problem of this knight on this square and could start to push white's pieces back with h6, and now white's going backwards, not forwards. So this is an option for Nakamura if he sees it. He doesn't want to grovel by putting his knight on b7, but it seems as though he could find, if he found this move, and it seems as, am I wrong? It looks that he has played knight c6, and knight takes knight is on the board. It's, it's for Nakamura to come back to the table to see if he finds this crazy move, knight to h5. He could play right now, having sacrificed the knight, leaving a rook hanging. He's got a real chance here. Wow, that move, knight h5, is a big surprise move. What a bizarre move, yeah. yeah but, but visually, it does make a great deal of sense. After all, this bishop on f2, uh, pardon me, the bishop on b6 trains its uh, sights against the f2 pawn, and you do unleash the rook. At, you know, for the moment, you leave the knight you don't recapture the knight, but you, you develop this counterattack against F2 pawn. Um, tactically, the, the computers are awesome. They see these things. The players are, you know, looking a little bit more mm, strategically. Well, it would be weird. It, it would be kind of interesting if he missed bishop takes F2, or obviously he saw it, maybe missed something in the variations, but, he, but, but, plays, but plays knight h5. Which is <laughs> a funny combination. <laughs> right, right. But stranger like, things have happened. It's certainly a missing field cup. Oh, so far so good. Yeah, absolutely. And meanwhile, uh, Fabiano Camarana didn't take on h8 right away, as you recommended, but instead played uh, just queen takes g3. And now Magnus on move as we bring in um, a guest to our studio, Grandmaster Levon Aronian, number two in the world. He is with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. Thanks, Jen. With Grandmaster Levon Aronian after a difficult loss. Uh, Levon, what happened in this game? Yeah, I, it was a misjudgment. I was very greedy, I have to say. I thought that by taking pawn, I, I have a good play, but I've missed this whole idea of uh, him capturing with the queen on a2. I think I had a good alternative around here uh, that I saw. I was planning to play that uh, c5 here. It's very interesting because the plan is knight takes c4, de, knight g5, and bishop c8. So uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting position. But then I kind of thought, all right, let's go with the pawn, and, and here, the touch screen is not yeah. working too well. Oh, right sorry. Now. And here I thought a take b and then uh, queen d7 and knight comes to the a6, you know, I have a pawn, but it she was... surprised you with this move, queen e3. Yeah, and I realized my position is very difficult. What I have done, of course, was not very intelligent. Rook f5 <laughs> and queen f6. I should have opted for a position with a pawn down. I should have uh, played knight d7 here. Knight d7, d5, bishop takes b2, uh, queen b2. Let me get up to that. Yes. And knight f6. Uh, of course, black is pawned down, but there are some chances to survive. So generally, I think it was just a uh, uh, wrong judgment 
on, on my side. You said you got greedy. What, what was that about? Yeah, I thought, you know, it's a pawn after all. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe uh, I'll get the time to just consolidate, but I never got the chance because, I mean, missing the idea that he can actually allow me to take the, the pawn on a2 and my position is terrible, then, yeah, that, that was critical for Did you game. notice, as soon as he played queen a3 and you started looking at the position, did you feel like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now? Actually not. <laughs> I thought, you know, I'll take another pawn. And only, <laughs> only after he took with a queen on a2, then I thought, yeah, something went really wrong. So a backwards queen move when the queen was already aggressive was, yes. was in yes. fact, a surprising moment. Yes. Often missed by... Very strong players. One of those moves Grandmaster Yeah, missed. it happens. So probably Black cannot really uh, play like this. Or if, if I play like this, after Queen D2, uh, move number 10, I should consider playing uh, DC Knight G5 and uh, Bishop D5. Yes. I thought this was interesting too. With but the idea of E4, E4. H6, just try to, you know... Try to hold on here. Yeah. I mean, it should be slightly worse for black, but at least, although, ah, probably I'm, I'm not judging it right. <laughs> well, this is certainly a, a difficult game for you. You came off a victory yeah. yesterday where you didn't play that great, but your opponent gave you a chance, not a chance today. How are you feeling about your form in this tournament after three rounds? Uh, so far, I'm not playing well, that, that I can say honestly. Uh, today, I think... Uh, I, I don't know, I, I just got too excited about uh, all this uh, structure change. But uh, I think I'll, I'll try playing more solid. I right, well, wish you the out. best of luck in the, best, in the rest of your games. Grandmaster Levon Aronian, after a difficult loss, uh, now at 50%. Back to you guys. Thank wow. you, Levon and the, the, Maurice. The, the, the number of decisive games in the synchro Cup so far, we're we're being spoiled. I oh, mean, indeed. Without, without no, question. sure, it's going to keep going. But um, let's take a look at. Let's jump to Magnus Carlsen's game uh, as we uh, wait for um, Maxime Bashir Legrand to talk about his latest win. Thank you to Grandmaster Levon Aronian, uh, number two in the world. Well, I'm going to call him and Fabiano number two in the world because it's kind of like Aronian it, it, was number two in the world. Changeable, for, right? Kind of like for the event and. Right. A live rating list. So, right. so here we've got a situation where Magnus looks all pinned down. Um, so we saw this position. Um, King takes h8. Now e6 has, has occurred to defend that pawn on e5. But now what about the bishop switching to the other diagonal? Bishop b6 check. Your knight is pinned, so you're forced over to h1. And Gosh, this looks dangerous. You, I'm you, trying to find you, you a, want, a rover. You, you want to do the rover routine. You want to bring your rook to... Uh, F4 so that you can make exactly. a checkmate down on the uh, H file. No, that's what I'm looking for, those oh, rovers. Definitely. Well, let's see. Well, first of all, it's a darn good question, frankly, Jen. I mean, this looks really tough. Uh, I thought that white might have to play like queen e2 instead of e6 or something to get rid of the pin mm -hmm. somehow. Well, I'm just wondering, do you see a good defensive move here? The move rook h4 just looks tremendous. Oh, I have like queen d6. Bishop b6 check has occurred and king h1. And now the question is, okay, so you're playing queen d6. So well, I do have rook f3. Uh, the point was was that, no, yeah, I just take the queen. I beg your pardon. Knight yeah. check. I, uh, I was looking at queen takes allowing queen h2. But oops, the white queen is just grabbed after uh, this situation. Oops. So how am I going to defend against rook f4? I'm missing something. Uh, I'm blind, I must um, well, confess. Well, you just start with, uh, I guess you start with knight h2. Well, the queen on d3 is hanging. Oh, yeah, I mean, we have to, uh, I mean. Uh, so have we seen the move rook f4 yet? Um, not yet, no. Um, Fabiano st still, oh, wait, I think we just see a move. Actually, queen g4 instead of rook f4. So clearly there was a defense to rook f4 of some sort. I'm, I'm blind. <laughs> um, knight, oh, okay. Um, what? What am I missing? I don't see the defense. It just looks over. Uh, e7? 
Ah, going east. Ah, check. And this is the point. The queen is in great shape to play queen h3. You take the pawn, but white's definitely defending this. Ah, thank you. So that is why we have actually seen uh, the superior move by... Queen g4, the, the, so just trying to play the same... Now, instead of the rook move, just trying to play uh, queen h5 here. And give and white this horrible knight on h2, where it's really defensive. When you can switch back to playing bishop c7, right? And I think Magnus is simply lost. I just, this looks terrible for for uh, the world champion. But we do have a special yes, guest. Yes, we do. In That's our, right. Uh, We've got a uh, Grandmaster Maxime Vachier-Legrave, who now is back on an even score. And winning a lot of American chess fans, it sounds Indeed, like. Indeed, that's right. And he's with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. We are with the number one player in France and one of the top ten players in the world, Maxime Vachier-Legrave. First of all, congratulations on your game. Thank you very much. Now, you played this game, and we saw this sacrificial possibility with takes on b3, and then you played this move queen to e3. You had obviously seen this coming. What did you feel right at this moment? Did you feel like full compensation, no way he's getting out of this one? Well, I thought maybe it was not so bad, but in p terms of political play, it's really difficult already. Uh, I thought actually Levon's best chance would have been to just give back the pawn up. I mean, allow me to play d5, and somehow he, he exchanges all the pawns on the Queen side probably ends up being a pendant, but there are still some practical chances. Actually, instead of queen e3, also interesting was maybe queen b4. Yes, the computer did point this out, and we saw this as well. This this was the preferred move was queen b4 actually, but your queen yeah. e3 was was good also. Yeah, no, actually I didn't play queen b4 because I didn't consider that after queen b6 I have queen c4. Then I noticed, okay, maybe. Okay, let's go back. The touch screen is not working, so ah, okay. I'm also using my left hand because I'm on this side, so it's a little bit. Yeah, so queen before, pawn takes a2 actually. And so that's why I didn't really get too much, but probably just doesn't work for black. So queen, queen b7, b7 is quite strong. Queen b6, queen a8, queen b2, queen a7, and rook f2. Rook f2 here? Yes. Wow. Wow, what a well, move. Computer laughs at me, it says <laughs> white is <laughs> still winning. What a move to spot coming in mm. advance. Rook takes f2. Well, obviously, king takes f2 is not so attractive because of bishop takes. Look at that geometrics to spot that move. Wow. Beautiful. But and uh, and the computer just thinks, but we can just take on a2 and, yeah, and everything's all right. Probably just winning. Well, still it's maybe Just a winning. Messy. That's... On the 2800 level, yeah, mm -hmm. just just winning. Yeah. But, but it's but still a bit messy, I mean, uh, the lines that the computer gives. So I, I don't regret too much, of course, because queen e3 also seems very strong. It was a very solid move. Yeah. How did it... Yesterday you lost a tough game, and now you had to clear your mind. How, w w it clearly was either easy to do so or hard to do so, or you just, you know, you're a professional, you did what you had to do. Uh, well, it's more or less I did what I had to do. So, I mean, uh, I looked at what went wrong. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I spotted everything, but then I decided to forget about it. Um, I watched some tennis this morning also, and uh, yesterday evening. So, I mean, pretty much back to, to a normal life after a loss and try to prepare for the next game. I mean, y you cannot just allow an early loss to spoil your tournament because then, I mean, there are still eight games against uh, all those great guys. So, you know, I had, uh, I had definitely to recover quite fast. Indeed. So the secret is look at your loss, see the reasons why, and watch some tennis. Exactly. And that'll do it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Maxime. Congratulations on your win and best of luck in the rest of your games. Thank you very much. Grandmaster Maxime Vachy Legrave, after a powerful win against the world number two for now player, Levon Aronian. Guys, back to you. And just want to point out that this is the first victory uh, for Max against Levon Aronian. Prior to this, he had lost three games, so um, that makes it a little bit sweeter playing against a player and winning against a player, I mean to say, that you've never defeated. So, so MVL. Wow, very, very impressive game. Uh, I just wanted to say that that move knight h5 
which was a crazy tactical move in the game between Topolov and Hikaru Nakamura was not played, understandably. Not a big shocker. Not a big shocker. <laughs> I mean, the, the computers are monsters in tactical alertness. And after knight takes c6, bishop takes c6, what you been, what Naka wanted to do was trade off this offside knight for this dominating central knight that didn't solve his problems because after bishop c3, setting up this very unpleasant pin against uh, black's uh, queen, Naka Mora is giving back the pawn with the move e5. Vessel and Topolov to play. Looks like 10 minutes to 12 minutes, so the players are pretty even in terms of the clock, but I think uh, Veselin has a very powerful initiative here, and, and uh, Hikaru uh, is under pressure. Wow, so we're gonna keep our eyes peeled on this. Uh, while we watch uh, Magnus Carlsen suffering, um, getting some uh, tweets about this game as well. People think that Carlson might be going down. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Claudia Munoz, our uh, classic champi champion here, national yeah. girls champion. And she says she'll come out and say it, that she's really, really sorry, but she's rooting for Fabiano. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you don't have to apologize. Uh, ch chess fans, root for whoever he you want. He is Italian-American, so it makes sense for some of the American girls to be rooting for him, right? Exactly. And it is nice to have our, to bring our, our international audience for all these players who have fans from all over the world. We, we see some Norwegians chiming in about the TV program mm -hmm. on, on Norway TV right. about magnets. Oh, absolutely. Right? And I, you just got to say, the Armenian community as well, Lavona oh, Lurian yes. is a national hero in Armenia. And the Armenian community, wherever he goes in the United States, turns out to, I, I've seen them. They just want to touch him, to have photos and his signature. He's a really big deal in oh, Armenia. Yeah. And then we've got Grandmaster Nigel Short, um, who said that he, one could not hope for more thrilling games. Hashtag Syncop, what a tournament. <laughs> and then uh, Bravo Maxime, je suis uh, fier d'être français. <laughs> well done. I think uh, that's easy for you to say. Somebody's saying uh, Maxime is awesome. Yes. yes. <laughs> and we've got Grandmaster Maurice Ashley with some news from our Topal game. Well, with my college French, which is not the best, he, I think he said, I'm proud to be French. So, uh, yeah, right now I'm sure there are a lot of Frenchmen and women who are proud to see their player, their top player, take down the number two player in the world. Well, the other game, there was the chance to take on F2 the first time for Nakamura, and there was a second chance to take on F2. He did not do either one, and he is now worse for sure. He has played this move e5, which does not leave a great impression at all because his pawns that were the bones of his position have simply disappeared from the board, and he has now uh, lost the pawn on e5. Rook takes e5 boldly. Is Topalov playing? The moment he moves this bishop away from b1, all his pieces will be coordinated. But most critically, we should note that the, there's the possibility of this queen landing on the c4 square with check to that king. That move is going to be very dangerous at some point for black. Their sacrifices abounding for white. So Topalov, according to the engines now, is up huge, a pawn and then some. Now, remember, the material is equal right now. So when, a, when an engine says that you're a one point something up, one means a pawn, it, it's saying I, you have a pawn in your hand. But he doesn't have a pawn in his hand, which is then saying, all of the pieces must be great, and a pawn is coming soon, and then some. The initiative continues, and all you have to do is look at the pieces. This bishop here is fantastic. These pieces are posted on great squares. The only remaining piece to come is this bishop, which could go here and possibly to that square. This rook is ready to jump into the game. Black's pieces look like targets, and most importantly, this king. Just take a look at that guy. He is worried about the dark squared bishop and the light squared bishop. Black is in deep trouble right now. Nakamura has blown this game, and he's going to have to fight for his life and hope for mistakes from Topolov, who is looking for his first win of this tournament. Guys? Thank you. Yeah, that game <coughs> is fiery as well. And meanwhile, speaking of fighting for their lives, Magnus Carlsen, with uh, just three minutes, less than three minutes, rather, of course, there is a 30-second increment, 
but less than three minutes for 13 moves. He's just played queen to d6, um, hitting the rook on f8, multi-purpose move, also um, doing some defensive duty on h2 mm -hmm. in case of rook f3 and queen h5 type stuff. Right. Not, not to mention the fact that f8 is hanging with jack. Right. So question, what's going on with our, our, our little rover now? Well, that is one question for sure, the idea of bringing this rook over to h5. I was looking at the more forcing uh, just by. to see if there wasn't something uh, going on in a variation like this. Sacrificing, oops, sorry, uh, sacrificing the exchange for two connected pass pawns. Right, you're going to get two pawns and you yeah, get that second pawn. With this, but probably with the exchange uh, Magnus will figure out a way of holding 